pause recording and here we go. So in the system, we're going to focus on on what's happening dynamically with that system with lots of other inputs. And then in the system, it has an interaction with the outside world, which is all this other stuff out here. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. So right now, we're not going to hold anything. Uh, we're going to look at dynamically the things that we can measure, which are volume. That's probably the easiest thing to measure. Right, so this square and pressure and temperature. You'll recognize that from the ideal gas law in chemistry. So obviously, the ideal gas law would still be uh, uh, in play. Now, as far as inputs, we can add heat, whatever that is, and we can add cold, whatever that is. Uh, actually, so this is cold, even though it looks like we're adding something, we're actually subtracting heat. So that's a good way to think about it. Our variable for heat is Q. And so this is adding Q, and then this is subtracting Q from our system. We have to recognize the fact that if we're adding heat to our system, it needs to come from somewhere. And it's coming from outside. Then we assume outside is so big that it's not going to have any uh, noticeable effect. But that's definitely the case. So we're going to inject some particles here. And I'm going to just stick a few in here and see how this goes. So. Let's uh, throw a few in there. So that's a good number. And you can see that they're going to bounce around. They all start off with about the same speed. But when they have collisions with each other, then they exchange momentum and they exchange energy. And sometimes they're on the receiving end and sometimes they're um, on the delivering end. So we'll jack it up a few more. Let's see what it looks like with another 20. Now here's one that had a collision and it almost stopped. So individually, this particle has very little uh, kinetic energy, but some of them are moving kind of quickly. On the average, it's appropriate for us to talk about their average kinetic energy, and that's what corresponds to temperature. So right now this says 300K. I'm gonna gas it up a little bit, haha, uh -huh. funny. And when we add heat, you can see that the temperature is increasing, but we don't really see a big change in what the speeds are. Like overall, they look faster, but... Okay, now we're gonna interject some other kinds of gases. And I'll make it an equal number of particles. So 20 heavy and 20 light. So here's my question for you. Why do the lighter ones go faster? Don't answer it yet, but then I'm going to ask you to answer in the chat in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, actually, I'm just going to switch to our notes. So it's the average kinetic energy that corresponds to temperature. Kinetic energy is what's happening on a microscopic scale and temperature is what's happening on a macroscopic scale. And in general, we refer to the RMS speed, which means root mean squared. We can't just take an average velocity because the average velocity would be zero. So instead, by squaring it and then taking a mean and then taking the square root of that, you can reverse engineer that formula and come up with a predictor for um, what we call the RMS velocity. Now, the distribution of molecular speeds is not symmetric. And the reason for that is because if the molecules weren't moving at all, then we define that as absolute zero. And because zero is involved, that throws out the symmetry of this uh, distribution. So the peak velocities are frequently not the same as the RMS value. The peak velocity or the most likely velocity or the most probable velocity is going to be lower. So now it's time to talk about what this heat is. We talked about temperature as a macroscopic manifestation about what's happening with the energy of individual particles in our ideal gas. But heat is how we can have an impact on that kinetic energy and by virtue of that, the temperature as well. So a couple of quick definitions. This is nothing new. Uh, calories you're probably familiar with in chemistry, but 
we're operating in physics under the SI system of units where you multiply units together and you get other units and they all work together. So SI units are more than just a list of units. It's a system of units that work together. And we'll see how that works in just a second. Um, but definitions of calories, because you're going to see them. So of course, one calorie is the amount of heat. You need to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Uh, the British thermal unit is something that we'll see occasionally in this class. And I just include it because it has a ridiculous definition. Uh, the heat necessary to raise one pound of water by one Fahrenheit degree. So silly. All right, so what do we got? We got heat. Uh, heat's a flow of energy. Heat is not energy by itself. It's a flow. And that flow happens because of a temperature difference. If there is no temperature difference, there's no heat flow. So that's a relatively easy thing to do. Is if you just, if you're listening to me, and we'll take a little Zen moment here. If you just place your palms together, uh, fingers point up, palms together, very reflective pose. And I'll ask yourself, but does it, does it feel warm? And then what does it mean to feel warm? Now, normally, if you open your palms up, we're used to heat leaving our bodies. Our bodies are a higher temperature than our surroundings. And we're used to that sensation. Some of us are, you know, feel it more than others. But we're used to that sensation of heat leaving our bodies. And so when you put your palms together, your palms feel warm, but not because they're at two different temperatures. It's because we have removed that outside pathway for heat to leave your body. So that's just kind of an interesting idea. And then that's our notion about what heat is, is that we can, you know, in terms of putting your palms together, you don't feel the heat leaving as fast as it normally would. And for, for us, that feels warm. So even just putting a sweater on, is not necessarily uh, adding heat to your body, but you'll feel warm because you were not losing heat as fast as you were before. Great. Now, if we broaden up outside ideal gases, we get to the idea of what, um, how molecules can actually store energy. So with ideal gases, because there are no bonds or anything like that, they can move in three dimensions and they can store energy by having velocity in any one of those three dimensions. But if we're talking about molecules, molecules can store uh, vibrations, kinetic energy in multiple ways. Because instead of just moving along three axes, they can rotate. They might have a little springiness to them. And so different materials will have different modes of storing energy. And those are called degrees of freedom. This is a really big idea. So I want you to think about this carefully. And I'm not sure how you're, you know, do notes or things like this, but this is a very important slide because it has to do with something called heat capacity. Now, I'm just going to zip back to uh, that ideal gas simulation that we had before. And I'd like you to think about this. We said that temperature, and of course, this is pretty hot, temperature is a reflection of the average kinetic energy of all the molecules in our system. Now, they don't all have the same velocity, of course. And they don't even all have the same kinetic energy. But the average kinetic energy is what relates to the temperature. So now I'm going to come back to that question again. Why do you think the red ones are moving so much faster than the blue ones? I'm going to ask you to throw in thoughts that you might have in on our chat. So go ahead and give it a shot. Remember, the key word was kinetic energy. And think about what the formula was for kinetic energy.
So friction is a good guess, but yeah, it's the mass part. So with a lower mass, um, in order to have the same kinetic energy, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So less m means that they have to have more v. Exactly. Now, the reason I bring that up, and friction is actually really interesting because, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you're probably guessing, it sounds like there's a dog on your porch, Mr. Chase. All right. Yeah. Degrees of freedom always drives Pluto crazy. So, <laughs> at any rate, um, if we were to add heat, the implication here is that these two materials might not increase at the same rate because they have different masses. So, let's take a look then at this situation. where we come to the idea about specific heat. So specific heat refers to, well, if we take equal amounts of material and then compare different materials and add the same amount of heat to them, their temperature is not going to increase uh, in the same way. So metals typically don't have a lot of ways of storing heat, and so their temperature will actually increase quickly. So think about it like this. Let's imagine that um, you were, uh, you had to fill up lots of beakers of water and you only had a fixed amount uh, of water to do that. So if you have lots of beakers of water and you empty, let's say you have a big bucket or something that, like that, and you have lots of beakers, say maybe a hundred, by the time you empty that bucket, the level of the beakers is only gonna go up a little bit. But if you only had one or two beakers, places to store water, then when you add your bucket, then the levels are gonna rise quickly. And that's what's happening here. So since the metals don't have lots of different ways to store heat, when you add heat, their temperature increases quickly. But water, on the other hand, has tons of ways of storing heat, tons of degrees of freedom. So you can expect to see a conceptual question in your future, pause. Here's pencils and pens being picked up. You can expect to hear a question in your future something to the effect of what is the connection between the number of degrees of freedom for heat storage in a material and its heat capacity? And the answer is the more degrees of freedom, the more different ways that, that molecules can store, uh, store energy is going to increase their heat capacity. So think about a walk on the beach this summer. Uh, the sand itself gets real hot, or at least gets hot quickly. At night, it cools off quickly, too. But the sand that's down by the water's edge, permeating with, with water all the time, is much cooler, and it takes a long time for it to heat up. That's because water has a really high heat capacity. Even right now, I think the lake temperature is 68 degrees, which can feel kind of cool, but it's going to stay 68 or in the 60s at any rate, well into October, uh, because water has a really high heat capacity. It can store energy based on translational motion, rotational motion, and vibrations intermolecularly and between molecules because of the intermolecular bonding. All right, so here we go, Q equals MC delta T. Let's take a look at our agenda really quick because I think we have a practice problem like this. So here we go. Let's start off with this first one. It says to what temperature will uh, 7,700 joules of heat raise three kilograms of water. So let's start off with this. We want to see uh, how the units work together too, because I mentioned about the SI units. Okay. I'm going to uh, Stop sharing my screen, and then you're going to see me, but then I'm going to switch to the other camera. Okay, here we go. So here's heat capacity. And it's the product of mass 
and specific heat capacity. So this is heat capacity per kilogram. And then this is the number of kilograms. So the plot of these two overall is what we call heat capacity. And if that number is bigger, if this number is bigger, then when you add heat, then the temperature change is going to be less. So you're pretty capacity, out of focus, just so yeah. you know. Completely out of focus. Yay. Yeah. Better? Getting there? No. No. <laughs> Still blurry. Maybe if I get my fat head out of the way. That's better. That's better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you for speaking up. All right, so heat capacity, the bigger it is, means that you're gonna have a smaller temperature difference, which is a little counterintuitive. I just wanted to point that out. All right, also comment too, because it's getting darker outside and I'm gonna balance the lighting thing, but uh, can I thumbs up if you can read this okay? All right, awesome. All right, so I'm going to start off by including units. And I believe it was three kilograms of water. And if you look at that chart, um, yeah, I should have mentioned that it probably would be beneficial. Uh, for, I don't know, you're getting used to tabs, right? So it might be uh, easier for you to also have this slide deck open because it's on uh, Canvas anyway. But we'll, we're going to take a break here in a couple minutes. <clears throat> All right, heat capacity for water. It's written in different ways, but if we're talking about by the kilogram, then it's a really big number. So 4186. Joules, joules per kilogram degrees C. And then we want to know what the temperature change is. So I'm just going to write delta T. I know the initial temperature starts off at 10 degrees centigrade. We could always just add that up, but I would, I'm interested in seeing what the overall temperature change looks like. Okay, well, just to take a look, you can see we've got joules up here and kilograms and the numerator kilograms and the denominator, so they cancel. And I have joules on both sides, so they also cancel. So this is just showing how the SI system works. And I can expect that my delta T, by the time I divide both sides by this, is going to wind up in degrees Celsius. So go ahead and use the chat. And uh, let's see what you get for this. You're going to multiply these two numbers together. And then use that to divide into 7,700. So not a lot, right? 0.6 degrees. And so the temperature, or the final temperature would be 10.6. But it seems like a lot of heat, and it's just demonstrating the fact three kilograms of water is actually a lot. So all right, cool. And if you're with this. So I, I assume you're dialing some stuff down, so I don't need to take a screenshot or anything. Okay, now <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, to take a look at the concept of calorimetry. And then we'll take a break. <clears throat> Calorimetry examines the exchange of heat between two different materials. And because of heat capacity differences, <clears throat> temperature is not going to evenly flow back and forth between the materials, but heat will. And again, 
this is an important concept. One of the things that you'll hear me say frequently is that we always want to put conceptual understanding before math. That's really key. So conceptually, the heat exchange between two materials will be the same, but the temperature exchange will not. So it's only heat that flows. Temperature does not flow. Temperature is just a macroscopic manifestation of what's happening internally with heat. So here's a simulation where we can, this is, I like this. Normally I don't like that simulations very much because, um, you know, it's, we'd like to get our hands on stuff. But thermodynamics is so inaccurate that this actually is beneficial. So let's suppose we're going to um, take some water and I assume we can put it here and we're going to add some heat. Come on. I assume I can take this thermometer and dunk it in there. That's fun. And so the temperature's going up. Okay, let's leave it like that. And then olive oil, why do we have olive oil? Well, I assume it's because you can get olive oil to a much higher temperature. So we're gonna hit the gas on that. I don't know why I can't turn the stove on and leave it on, but. Okay, and then we're gonna take a chunk of iron and, and throw it into the beaker. All right, make it hot. Come on, come on. Okay, link heaters, what's that? Oh, I got it. <laughs> Ooh, heat's leaving, I can tell. I'm gonna cool this off a little bit. Look at the heat leaving. Nice. Okay, we've cooled this down quite a bit. So the principle of calorimetry, and I'm just to demonstrate this, is that I can take my now hot iron from the olive oil and drop it in, and you can see the temperature of the water uh, increases, but not very much. So in this process, the water and the temperature, or the water and the iron rather, will come to the same temperature because they will exchange heat until they are at the same temperature. Remember, heat transfer only happens because of a temperature difference. So when I dunk the iron in, it has a higher temperature than the water does. So it's gonna shed heat into the water until everything's the same temperature. And that's the principle of calorimetry. So let's go and take a look at another practice problem. And uh, number 12. So this is gonna take a little bit. This is, um, but it's good to, to see the complexity of this. And uh, so let's just kind of review this for a second. And if you want to jot down some key indicators, let's focus on this idea. So we're going to have a um, hot material, copper, so 245 grams of it, but we'll go ahead and convert that into kilograms right off as we're jotting things down. And it's copper, and it starts off at 285 degrees Celsius. Good, and then um, I'm not gonna worry about this calorimeter cup. But well, anyway, should we? No, let's scratch that, because it's just gonna take a little bit too long. Um, and uh, I just wanna take a look at uh, a basic application. So now we're going to put it at 825 grams of water, which is 0.825 kilograms, and it's initially at 12 degrees. Okay, and before we head to the board, we'll take a look at what the heat capacity is for copper. It's a metal, so its heat capacity is going to be really small. Notice that there are two columns here. So this is calories, which of course are legit to use, but we want to mostly live in this column right here, which are the SI units. And so 390 joules per kilogram. And 4186 for water. 
Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and change blanks. Blank slate. Awesome. Did my fancy calculator go? That's okay. Let's, let's set it up. So we start off, we have this chunk of copper. We're still in focus. And so <clears throat> this copper is the one that's at 285 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of hot. Then we have a beaker of water. Water's blue, right? A beaker with that nice blue water. And this is only at 12. And when the two are immersed, then we're going to have a combination and they'll exchange heat. And so they're both at the same temperature, which we would call equilibrium temperature. Since the copper is initially at a higher temperature, it's going to do off heat. Until the average kinetic energy of both the copper and the water is the same. You need to return it's the same temperature. So in these calorimetry type problems, we have to keep track of the fact that there is hot stuff and there's cold stuff. So I'm just going to write it just. Uh, like this, Q hot plus Q cold is equal to zero. That looks like a conservation law. Meaning that with an energy transfer, something's going to lose heat and something's going to gain it. Now, it's kind of surprising that you can add two things together and get zero. That's obviously only going to be the case if one of them is negative. So what do we do? Do we make this one negative? It turns out that's not really uh, the case. Let's go ahead and uh, throw some variables on this. So M C delta T plus M C delta T is equal to zero. But if we think about the delta T's, this is going to go from 285 down to some other number. We don't know. And this is going to go from 12 up to some other number. So this delta T is going to be positive and this one's negative. So that's how come these two terms can add up to give you zero. So now let's throw all the numbers in and then we'll, we'll pound on it with your algebra hammer. So I haven't set that in a while. So 0.245 kilogram. And I'm not going to use the units because that, that's just going to be confusing. And then the heat capacity for copper is 390. And when we do delta T, we always do final minus initial. So the final temperature is this equilibrium temperature we're talking about, minus 285. And we know they have to wind up at the same final temperature because that's when heat flow stops. So our water, we've got a lot of water here, and it has a huge heat capacity. So we're probably not going to see the water heat up very much. So 0.825 multiplied by 4186. And then GF minus 12 is equal to zero. All right, so this is looking pretty good. We only have one variable. So we got a good shot at solving this. And I would just uh, take the step, the intermediate step of just multiplying these two together first before we apply the distributive property because uh, don't forget that this number actually represents heat capacity. So I would like to use this to demonstrate the important role of heat capacity. And I'm just going to round it off to whole numbers. So this is going to be 96. 
times tf minus 285. Those of you that have not had me uh, as an instructor uh, will probably be wondering about significant digits. And those of you who have had me before will remember that I don't care. Two or three sounds good. <clears throat> Only one significant digit is very informative. And six significant digits, uh, I would suggest you get a different hobby. So TF minus 12. Right, equals zero. Okay, now, just again, I wanted to focus in on these numbers because you can see this is a huge heat capacity compared to that of the copper. So we expect the temperature final to wind up much closer to 12 than the 285. All right, so we're gonna expand this out. And I'll take this step with you just to make sure that um, we don't lose anything. This is sort of like a weighted average. And so the coefficient from this term is a lot bigger than that one. So that's how come the final temperature winds up a lot closer to 12. Maybe yell if I do something wrong. We were in a regular uh, in person. I'm sure I would have made a mistake by now. Great. So now collect like terms and solve. If you got an answer, please throw it up in the text box. And if any of you have seen my graphing calculator, please give, let me know where I put it. Now, in this example, when you get to a final answer, that is the final temperature. You don't have to add it to the initial because um, we use the initial temperatures anyway. Yay, look at you go. That's great. Okay, it is 6.53 right now, and I think it would be nice to take a break, go get refreshing beverage, um, whatever you need to do. I would expect that we're probably going to be on for maybe another uh, another hour, something like that, to get through the material I was hoping for. Hopefully this is helpful to you, that you have an opportunity to, to practice together. and. Um, In the next half of class, what I'd like to do is to get you to do some of this work together, but see if you can actually talk 
about it in a breakout chat. So let's come back at 7.10. And I'll stay here anyway, um, so that you can ask me a question. I'm gonna shut off my video, but I'll still have my audio plugged in. So if you do wanna to, uh, talk to me or ask a question, something like that, I'd be happy to, to listen in. So I'm gonna pause recording for right now, and we'll come back at 7.10. Okay, cool. <clears throat> So there's another way that materials can exchange thermal energy or heat, and that's called latent heat. It's another way to store energy, but it's a mechanism for storing energy that's not really kinetic, it's more potential. And then that's why we call it latent. So it's thermal energy that's stored in molecular bonds as potential energy, and it can be released or absorbed. So this slide is, kind of a famous one, it always shows up in textbooks. But what it's talking about is if we are adding heat, um, what happens to the temperature and what happens to the phase? So if we start off with ice at 40 below and you add heat, the ice is gonna warm up. But when it gets to zero degrees, it's gonna start melting. Water and ice can both exist at zero degrees. Once all the ice has turned into water. Now the water can increase its temperature, but it can't increase its temperature until all the ice is melted. And then the temperature will go up. And the slope, the rate at which it goes up, the rate at which heat causes the temperature increase is the slope. And actually in, in the first hybrid lab that we do, this is gonna be a key feature. We're gonna use this to calibrate a heat source. Then, Obviously, this huge area here is to emphasize the tremendous amounts of energy that are stored in the phase change from water to steam or steam to water. So, and that's important for us to think about, you know, what's happening if, if you're going from water to steam, are you releasing heat or are you gaining heat? Which one is which? But it's immense. And this is what we're seeing in some of the violent weather that's happening around the globe associated with phase changes and climate change. So um, <laughs> that windstorm that we had on Saturday, no, Sunday, yeah, that was, that was something. Um, but again, it was a really deep low pressure system. And um, that's where the energy comes from, is this phase change. As you might imagine, there are lots of things that, uh, um, can go through a phase change. It's not just about water, but most of the story is about water. And uh, some of the phase changes happen at really extreme temperatures, but there are a couple of things I'd like to point out to you about this. And again, if you haven't already done so, I would recommend uh, in a different tab to open up the, these notes and have this one handy in front of you. Now there's um, a real trick here I want you to watch out for. So, if you follow where my mouse is hovering, heat of fusion is associated with phase changes from liquid to solid, or solid to liquid either way. And then when we go over to uh, vaporization, that's um, phase change associated with liquid to um, gaseous, gas to liquid. But the units are kind of tricky here because you notice that heat capacity was in joules per kilogram, and this is in kilojoules per kilogram. So if we went down and took a look at heat of vaporization for water coming in at 2260 kilojoules per kilogram, if we were to write this in the same units as heat capacity, this would be 2.26 million joules per kilogram. So it's three powers of infinite, three orders of magnitude more significant than just the heat capacity of water. That's immense. So you want to watch out for that. The units can kind of mess you up if you're not careful. This is kilojoules, and we'll do problems that involve both heat change, you know, latent heat and uh, temperature change. So we just want to be careful. Now this statement up here is a conceptual one, and it's it takes a little bit of time for you to become comfortable with this. So when you're forming the bonds, that releases energy. When two atoms are bonded together, it's going to take energy to break them. And so when they form, they actually release energy. Uh, 
we can get into this in a little more detail, but essentially a bound state is a negative energy state. And in order to get to a free state, you have to add energy. So when we're, these bonds are formed, they release energy. Therefore, condensation, gas to liquid, freezing, liquid to solid, release energy into the outside environment. We call these warming events, which is weird, right? Condensation, it's a warming event. And what we mean by that is that the act of condensation releases energy. Now, right here, I have a club soda uh, right next to me and I can see condensation around it. So this is worthwhile talking about. And you're well familiar with the concept of condensation, but I don't have ice in this. When I started uh, tonight, I had a nice, healthy amount of ice in this liquid. And I, when I'm looking at the condensation, you, condensation, are what melted my ice. It's that condensation that released energy into the glass that melted the ice. So it's an interesting way of thinking about it, but uh, if I was able to somehow, uh, I don't know, prevent condensation from happening, maybe having it in a cozy or something like that, that's why uh, my beverage would stay colder for longer. All right, well, back we go. I have kind of a really silly, um, set of slides that talks about the direction of heat flow in these situations. Um, when these bonds are broken, <clears throat> it requires energy in order for that to happen. So this is an easy thing for you to try sometime, but uh, if you have a glass of ice water and uh, you add some salt to it, the salt is gonna help melt the ice. However, one thing that most people don't think about is it actually makes things really cold. So in the wintertime, when salt gets applied to the highways, it's supposed to melt the snow. But in the process, it actually makes the roadways colder. So there are temperatures at which salting the roads doesn't work anymore. And that's pretty cold. It's like between 10 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you uh, do this, if you add salt to just regular ice water, it makes it incredibly cold, much colder than regular freezing temperature. Temperatures can get down to like, 15 degrees, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's how come uh, ice cream was able to be made back in the day, is if you have this container of cream and eggs and vanilla, and you seal it up nice and tight and then immerse it in an ice bath that you've added salt to, that process of melting the ice extracts heat from the contents of your um, what's inside and pretty soon it's gonna freeze it. So that's how come ice cream was invented long before refrigeration, which is kind of fun. All right, so how do we use this? Well, here's, again, I apologize. This is kind of sophomoric of me, but uh, let's just do a little visual visualization of this. Uh, and essentially, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll do it with our uh, gas properties one. So our gases are still milling around here. And uh, I'm gonna do something that's a little bit different. I'm gonna see if I can turn gravity on. Yeah. No, it doesn't look like gravity is an option. What I will do though is, um, oh, what's collision center? Ah, interesting, okay. Um, there's, a, there's an opening right here. And I'm gonna, Open it up a little bit. Now watch what happens when particles leave. Oh, a very fast one. Usually it's the faster ones that leave. And when the faster ones leave, their energy is no longer available for energy sharing collisions. So the average kinetic energy drops. And that's how come you can see that when particles leave, that the temperature drops, right? That was a fast moving heavy particle, so the temperature dropped quite a bit. These little ones, it uh, doesn't really matter too much. Uh, and then we had a slow one leave, which didn't cause the temperature to drop too much, but there we go. Right, so we see some of these faster particles leaving and the temperature cools off quite a bit. All right. Yeah, so it's a really silly little story here, but um, so imagine water molecules and so they're having a conversation. We have free particles up here in vapor and we have 
particles are, are, um, have intermolecular bonds. And so that's the, the primary difference between liquid and vapor. But in these energy, uh, energy sharing collisions, sometimes it's just a completely random event that an atom might experience a collision that gives it enough kinetic energy to overcome the uh, bonds that are keeping it as a liquid. And then it leaves. So, hey, we're just giving me some energy. Yep, yep, yep. Right. So, because the molecule that left had a higher kinetic energy than the average, then the overall average decreases. And that's why vaporization is a cooling event. Okay, so that's the end of the new notes. And what I'd like to do now is to take a look at a couple of practice problems for this. So, we looked at this uh, calorimetry one right here, and we got. Uh, the answer you shared by the chats was correct, of course. <clears throat> Taking a look at number 14, it talks about a mystery substance heated to 330 and placed in a calorimeter cup that has water and also has a glass thermometer. So if you were going to do a problem like that, we're not going to do this one because it's way too involved, but you would have to have a cue for each one of these. And that's uh, pretty tedious. So let's take a look at um, one that involves a heat transfer. So uh, let's see, let's pick a good one here. And uh, yeah, we could go ahead and do number 26. I'm just gonna change the spacing a little bit so it's easier to see that. <clears throat> so let's get down some of the specifics about this particular problem. All right, we've got an iron boiler. And uh, just to put a practical spin on it, so this is a pretty large boiler. I remember going to Prohibition Pig in Waterbury to uh, where their bar is, and then they have uh, a big kettle or a couple of big kettles right behind it. Thumbs up if you've been to Propeg. And, uh, and I was just marveling at how much liquid they were heating up there. And I was asking some questions about how much fuel they must go through in order to boil that thing. And apparently that's the number one cost in brewing beer is the fuel to heat it up. And then we have 830, so this is uh, iron, and then we have 830 kilograms of water. That's at 18 degrees. And then we're gonna add heat at a rate of 52,000 kilojoules per hour. Now it's interesting, you know, should we convert that uh, kilojoules into like joules per second? Or uh, I think let's hang on to this because I have a feeling that boiling this water is going to take a while and hours might actually be a reasonable unit to report our answer in. So how long does it take for the water uh, to get to the boiling point and then <clears throat> be uh, to change everything into steam? Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and before we leave, let's write down what we have for heat capacity for for um, iron, and that's 450. But let's turn that into kilojoules per kilogram. And so that's going to be 0 0.45 kilojoules, because I just know we're going to do not only is the rate at which we add heat in kilojoules per hour, but also the heat of vaporization for water is in kilojoules. That's 2260. All right, and yeah, question? All right, let me get some of these details up on the whiteboard then. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Change my camera. How's the focus looking? Okay, good. So let's get some of these details up here.
So we have this heat source. Does that look like heat to you? I don't know. And we're going to be pumping heat in at 52,000. I don't know how well red is showing up, but this is the only thing I'm going to draw red. So 52,000 kilojoules uh, per hour. And then we have this giant iron kettle that is, excuse me, it's got water in it. And so the water is 830 kilograms. And then the kettle itself is 230 kilograms. So we have two things we're heating up. That means we're gonna have two cubes. <clears throat> we're gonna have an MC delta T for each one. And so we're gonna be adding heat, but this is an interesting way of writing it. There's a time factor in here. So we wouldn't call that heat necessarily. This is the rate at which heat is added. We call this instead power. So if you remember from physics one, power is the rate at which you add energy. And so energy itself would be equal to power times time. That's how come we can wind up solving for time. So power times time, is going to be equal to the Q for each one. And that's going to be the mass of the iron, the heat capacity of the iron. And we're trying to boil this away. So this is going to be a delta T and then another MC delta T for the water. So we'll have one term for iron and one for the water. Now, the initial temperature is given to us 18 degrees. So that means delta T is going to be the same for both of them. We both start off at 18, and then they go to boil. So delta T is going to be equal to, uh, well, 100 minus 18 is going to be 82 degrees. All right, well, here we go. <clears throat> so I know what the power output is, and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go with kilojoules per hour. Um, we can go ahead and add that in, 52,000. I'm gonna write the units for this side of the equation, just as a reminder. So that's multiplied by time. Okay, now here from the MC delta T's. So 230 and multiplied by 0 0.45 and the temperature change is 82. And then water, 830. Or 0.186 times 82. All right, just want to pause for a second and underline. <clears throat> when we looked up on the, the table, the heat capacity for iron was 450 and water was 4,186, but we've changed it to kilojoules, so it matches. So that's the note about why that's done. Now we can actually just multiply these out, add them together and divide both sides by 52,000. So you can do that without my help. I want you to go ahead and throw the number in the chat once you have it. And and we'll see how you do.
Yes, spot on. Looks good. Yeah, so in general, three significant figures is fine. Or two. <laughs> I don't take points off for significant digits. That's one of the things I have to check out with mastering physics. I want to see how they do that whole thing. All right, so uh, what I'd like you to do is to try and do the next piece. And we're just going to do two more. Uh, yeah, so the timing looks just about right. So I'd like you to finish this problem off, um, but do it in a break room. So here's what it looks like. We'll get you started. But now instead of the heat added giving us a temperature change, it's going to give us a phase change. And so power times time. Is going to take my I'm giving too much away. Yeah, otherwise what are you going to chat about? <laughs> okay. so. Um, I'm going to uh, break you up into, uh, let's do three chat rooms, and I'll make it five minutes long. That should be plenty. Might even, I'll bounce in and out of the chats to see how you're doing. We'll end it early if, uh, if need to. All right, so we're going to go into four uh, breakout rooms. Really quickly discuss what numbers you need to do this and what the steps will look like. Shouldn't take you too long, but it's a great way. Please introduce yourselves. Uh, if you, I know your names are right there, but just uh, say hi and, you know, what do you think about uh, this technique so far? So here we go. And uh, um, I will uh, bring us back in a couple of minutes. How's it going? Good. So the only number you need is uh, just the heat of vaporization. So E times T equals L M L V. Does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm good. Pop out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Reach steam? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to, I'm trying to remember this from chemistry, and it's like way. <laughs> yeah, I took that. Yeah, one. bar bag, totally. <laughs> Maybe even three. 
Um, and so we just need to raise the temperature of the iron a little bit more, but then the water has to do a phase change. Mm -hmm. That phase change takes a lot more energy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about increasing the temperature of the iron. So it's already at 100, right? So it's just the heat that you need is just how much heat you need to vaporize the water, which is M times the heat of vaporization for water. We call it LV, which is the 2260. So it's just power times time equals M times that number. And solve for M. All right, so I'm going to end this in another minute, but I'm going to pop out to another room. Does that seem OK? And the 2260 is kilojoules, right? It is kilojoules already, yeah. OK. So many tabs up. Oh, perfect. Kilojoules per kilograms. Okay, so, and we have that 5,200 is kilojoules per hour. Yes. So, no. if we do, so basically, if we just think about it in terms of units, so we have 52,000, and that's kilojoules per hour. And then we have the other one, which is kilojoules per kilogram is that what you said yeah. yeah um and we know the weight of what we started with which was probably that 230 kilograms plus the 830 it might Except, all cancel out well if you're vaporizing the iron that's going to be fun no oh. <laughs> try not <laughs> so, to do that <laughs> you would have to melt it first and then yeah so you're on the right track but the heat associated with vaporizing is going to be the mass times the heat of vaporization, right? Which is the 2260. And so M is the thing you don't know. So power times time, P times T equals M times the heat of vaporization, which is the 2260. And you're solving for M. So okay. I know, you know, logically we try and put a few extra constraints on it, but it's actually, it, it's not as complicated as that. And the M you're using is only the water. <laughs> Is just the water, okay. Yeah. So I think you're in good shape. I'm gonna pop out and then I'll probably end this in about a minute. Okay, thanks. Cool. How's it going? Uh, it's going. <laughs> <laughs> it's going. going. All right. So let's just, um, is it a little bit confusing or? Um, I think I got it, but I think I accidentally put the, uh, the numbers in the wrong place. Yeah, that's, uh, that's understandable. So the correct answer is 36 hours uh, to boil it away. And the heat that's needed to vaporize is just going to be the mass of the water, not both of them, just the mass of the water times the heat of vaporization, which is the 2260. Right? So we have power times time equals mass times the heat of vaporization, which is 2260. Yeah. The ball was up the road. And the mass you're using is just the mass of the water, so 830 kilograms. So you don't have to include the. Um. Yeah, because um, the temperature is of the iron is not going to increase because the boiling water is still going to be at 100 degrees. So there's no extra term. That's actually really common. That's what some people were thinking in the other breakout rooms, but. It is already at 100, and so water boils at 100. All right, so I'm going to end the breakout room in about 30 seconds.
Uh, Professor Chase, do you mean to be muted? Were you having a hard time understanding me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Can you see the whiteboard then? Yes. OK. Uh, actually, let me, I'm going to switch to the better camera. So. No, I will see. All right. <clears throat> Okay. I'm going to give you a big ice cube. It's at zero degrees, 0 0.25 kilograms. And we're going to throw that into a bucket of water. And we'll make it warm water. So here's our bucket. And this is going to be water, like I said, warm water at about 50 degrees Celsius. And a lot of it. So seven, five kilograms. So three quarters of a kilogram, a quarter of a kilogram. And the ice is going to go in there. Kerplunk. And the hot water is going to give up heat that melts the ice. And I want you to find out what is the final temperature. T F equals question mark. But there's one complication. So usually what we would do is say that the Q for the hot stuff plus, which is going to be uh, a loss. This is the hot stuff and it's going to lose heat. Plus the Q for the cold stuff is going to be out of, out of zero. So this is going to be a loss. And this is going to be a gain. This is going to be an MC delta T. But this is going to be two things. One of them is going to be a phase change as the ice becomes liquid. But you're not going to use vaporization. In this case, you're going to use fusion. So the heat of vaporization for fusion is going to be under the other column. And again, we're still talking about water. But what happens is that after you melt the ice, after you take the zero degree ice and turn it into the zero degree water, it still has to warm up. So it also has an MC delta T. All right, let's pull back and just think about what this is. This is the hot stuff. <clears throat> This is 0.75 kilograms. This is where we're back in uh, joules and so not kilojoules. So 4.186. No, uh, sorry. We do need to, <laughs> sorry about that. Just kidding. Uh, we should be in kilojoules for this one. So this is going to be 4186. And the delta T, this is the hot stuff. So it's going to be TF minus 50. And then this mass is the mass of the ice, so that's 0.25. And then this is the latent heat of fusion for ice, so you can look that up. And we don't have to uh, worry about whether this is plus or minus right now, because we know the cold stuff is going to gain heat. This is the one that's going to be negative, because the temperature is going to drop. So this will have a minus sign as part of it. So this is going to be plus. There's no, since there's no delta, we can't rely on the delta taking care of the plus and minus. And then this one, this is the cold stuff. This will also be, I mean, unfortunate, right? I should probably try the diagram the other way, but 
uh, this is going to be a positive delta T. This is going to be the final temperature minus zero because that's what happens after the ice melts. It's now at zero. So these two M's are the same. 0.25. The C value is again for water. So 4186 kilojoules per kilogram degree C. And what you're solving for is TH. So again, I'm going to do uh, breakout rooms for you, and uh, and I'll have a fixed time. So I'm just going to make it five minutes. And I'd also like, you know, when you get to the end of this, I'd like you to also just think about what do you think about the format for the class tonight so far? How about the break? Was the break at the right time? Was it too long, too short? Uh, was it easy to understand everything that I was talking about? So I'd like to get a little bit of feedback when we come back. We'll talk about the answer to this. And then I'd like to have just a little open chat about uh, how you felt about the evening. Okay, so here we go. This will be random. Set timer for three minutes.
okay, you can reach back. And if you were able to do this, you really have done a nice job putting everything together. So my answer is on the board. In about 30 seconds, I'm just going to walk through it real quick. It's a little complicated, so there are a lot of little places where you can make a mistake. But as far as difficulty level goes on a scale of one to five, this is a solid four. Let's just walk through this. We said this is a hot step. <clears throat> 0.75, 4186, because this is kilojoules per kilogram per degree C. And then here's our delta T. But the initial temperature is 50, so Tf minus 50. And now the rest of this is for the ice cube. The ice cube needs to melt first, so this is how much energy it takes to melt it. There's no delta T for this one. But once it melts, again, now it's at zero. It still has to warm up to the final equilibrium temperature. So 0.25 times 41.86 times Tf and the initial temperature is zero. And now we can just do the math and expand things out. And the product of these two is the heat capacity for this water, which is 3140. And you can see that that's one of the bigger numbers on here. It tends to dominate the whole thing. And then <clears throat> times 50. So that's how much energy that it potentially could lose if it went all the way down to zero. And then 0.25 times this is 83. So this is how many kilojoules it's going to take to melt the ice cube. <clears throat> and then multiplying this out, well, you don't need two terms because it's just zero. So 1046. Then we're going to multiply, combine like terms to the, the two TFs. I get 4186 TF. Not really a coincidence because this is 0.75 and 0.25. So yeah. And then I bring everything else to the other side of the equation. So that instead of being negative, this is now positive. And then I subtract the 83 from that to get this. And then divide both sides to get 37.5. And that sounds about right. <clears throat> so it wasn't a very big ice cube, but it does soak up a lot of energy trying to melt it. It's quite possible that you could add enough ice, like if this M was bigger, you know, if say this was like a kilogram of ice, then you would actually have ice left. And this happens all the time, right? That's how come you put ice in your refreshing beverages. So you have some ice left there and cooled it down to zero. All right, so in the last couple of minutes, I would appreciate it if you could uh, unmute and we just have a quick chat about how things went. I hold it up. Was that long or? I think it felt fine. Yeah, I agree. It was good. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really hard to teach yourself. Uh, it's it's kind of complicated, and I've just seen like way too many hours of students banging their head against the wall and not getting the help they need. So, anyway, I think it'll. So, helpful to oops, go back and like rewatch the recordings for things that I didn't understand like that's not something you get to do in like an actual in-class experience yeah that's an interesting observation so this is going to be on YouTube and I'll put a link to uh, the YouTube video in Canvas okay good yes just uh, for a zoom question yeah um, how do I make, when you do the problem at the end, I still see everyone's screen. How can I make just you bigger for the explanation at the end? Yeah, so uh, let's see, under speaker view, it's, it's gonna be one of those settings. So in the upper Perfect. right corner. Yeah. Upper right, thank you. Yeah. And 
sometimes uh, it might be useful for you to have a, a screenshot, you know, so if you use something like snipping tool or there's the same thing on a Mac where if you get to a point like, hey, I'd like to save that work, you know, to just grab a screenshot of it too. So that's the check. All right, so for Thursday, hopefully you do five questions and five problems and you can send them to me by email. If you're gonna use your phone to take a picture, please make sure the contrast is good. I mean, look at the picture before you send it. <laughs> so if you can't read it, then I'm gonna have a hard time. And, uh, and, and that should be great. So I think that one of my goals was for you to build up some confidence with the material. And even though this was two hours, it's much more efficient for you to do it this way than for you to struggle through a bunch of online material. At least that's my opinion. So hopefully it was two hours well worth it and you have enough confidence now to try some problems on your own. And then we'll take a look at the second half of this chapter on heat on Thursday. Right? That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a couple of people who are absent. If there are friends of you who have missed it, please tell them to check on Canvas for the link to the YouTube recording. Okay. All right. So we'll see you Thursday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.